Oh, yes. Thank you. So we, we welcome all um, viewpoints, and if there are people here who, who for example, um, think that the, um, the Ukraine war is a, like is a kind of just war, and the principle of a just war is a, um, um, is a kind of defensible principle, then it's really important that, that they feel able to speak here, that we actually listen we really listen to what people have to say. People don't get like shouted down. We don't want to do that here. That's not what the series about. So I just wanted to say that. Um, <coughs> so, uh, um, so our group has um, uh, decided that um, this is something that this is a conversation that needs to start because um, I guess we've been very disappointed at the, at the lack of a of a critical conversation about this war for the last year and that. And um, the person uh, within the group who should take credit is Kevin here, who um, about th three or four months ago said in a conversation, you know, why aren't we talk talking, talking about this war? Why aren't we um, at least like taking a position on, uh, on it and having, having a conversation about it? So like on the basis of that, we, uh, we actually created this um, this leaflet, um, de-escalation, negotiation, disarmament, which we've been handing out on the high street now for about th three or four months. Um, and you all should have had one of those on your chair. And then, um, and then from that, we decided that, that we like to try and um, start a conversation with, within the local media. So we, um, I think, about eight or nine of us who, who, um, who uh, help on the street stall um, signed a letter that we, we wrote to the local newspaper, the, uh, the, the Australian News and Journal, which was published on the 15th of February under the title, Let's Unite uh, Against Wars. And um, the idea of that letter was to, was to kind of start a conversation about this. this this conversation that was that there's been a kind of deafening silence about this war, except of course within the mainstream media, there's been you know what uh, what I perceive as being an extremely one-sided view, um, which has been uh, uh, basically pro-Ukraine um, and uh, that Putin and Russia are, are, uh, are evil, uh, evil invaders. That's the that's the broad narrative that's been kind of created by the mainstream. And um, particularly um, uh, when I went to a conference, that I think Richard here was one of the organisers of it in Lansdowne Hall about um, six or nine months ago. And like hearing hearing these very learned speakers and historians talking about the whole history of this area and the kind of geopolitics of it, going back sometimes two or three hundred years, 
you've really brought it home to me that this is far more complicated what's actually happening there than just uh, uh, than a, than a kind of expansionist imperialist country wanting to take over countries around it. It's far more complicated than that, and I think that to engage with the um, with the complexity of that, I think is really important. Um, what's been what's been very pleasing is that the letter that we had in the Australian News and Journal has actually spawned, has started to spawn this conversation. So, for example, last week in the SOJ there was um, there was a very good, well, there was a letter which I thought was a very good letter by, um, hmm, I, I, it's here, sorry, it's on this sheet, by someone called um, James Derriere from Kemble, um, which was, which was, you know, making the kind of case that the Freedom Group would actually want to make. There have, there have also been two very good letters uh, published in the, uh, in the Gloucester Citizen, because we also, uh, it was also published in the Citizen and, um, and the Gloucestershire Echo, and there's been two, there have been two very good responses by um, Frank um, Chaco, who's actually the father of, uh, of um, oh, Father of the editor of the Morning Star, who clearly also um, um, takes a very um, strong view about the war. And in fact, I brought the one that uh, that's in um, this week's Crossroads Citizen. I'm very going to quickly read it because I think it's such a such a good letter. Um, it says um, it's called "Blame for Conflict Cannot All Be Laid at Putin's Door," and it says regarding David Slinger's letter uh, um, last week. Most people know Russia has behaved criminally, but it is foolish to think that invasion is simply down to Putin's imperial ambitions and weakness and ignore the historical context. The Russian-speaking Donbass and Luzhank uh, uh, <coughs> voted for independence after the 2014 Ukraine coup, which ousted democratically um, uh, elected President Yanukovych, as they were very worried by the extreme nationalist element in Ukraine. War could have been avoided if the US had effectively, hadn't effectively sabotaged the Minsk uh, agreement uh, that allowed some autonomy for those regions. Also relevant is that, is that the UK promised Russia not to move eastward when the Soviet Union broke up. So that's just the first part. I'm not going to read all of it because I'm already taking up uh, more time than I wanted to. I think the important point there is that um, there is a very legitimate um, alternative view to the one that we've been hearing on the mainstream. And um, I was a bit shocked but delighted on last Friday's BBC um, Ukraine cast, which is a daily podcast uh, on the BBC, which I've been listening to for the last year and, and which has given incessant propaganda supporting one particular view. Last Thursday, they had Professor John um, Mearsheimer, who's a who's a, 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 a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, who in 1915 gave a, gave a lecture called... 2015. 2015. 2015. 2015. Yes. He said 1915. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah. in, in, uh, in 2015, he gave, he gave a lecture called Why is Ukraine the West's fault? And it's, it's so far been watched by 20 being watched by 28 million people. And um, what he said was that, uh, was that the promise that was being made to Ukraine to take it into NATO, quote, would inevitably seem by, be seen by Russia as an existential threat. And then, um, and it, and then he also said, with the end result, that uh, Ukraine is going to get wrecked. 
So, so this was a this was a very esteemed professor of physical science talking in 2015, predicting that that if um, Russia's legitimate concerns about NATO going right up to its border and violating the Minsk um, uh, the um, um, Minsk agreements uh, were going to be ignored. This was a this was a very very brave step to take. So. Um, uh, it's really worth going back to that that, that podcast and listening to it and uh, and uh, um, listening to the interview. The other two things that, that I want to say is that um, personally, given my own professional history as a as a therapist, psychotherapist, psychologist, <laughs> I'm I'm particularly interested in the psychology of war, and I think it would be great if people who have that Sort of perspective, and and, 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 and you're interested in, in that in, in that way of trying to understand, yeah, you know, both this war, but wars in general, were to maybe meet up and to start a conversation about that, because I think to understand the psychology of war and why wars happen is enormously important. Finally, <clears throat> um, three or four days ago, I woke up with a vision. And when that happens, and it happens from time to time, I really, I really take notice of it. And the vision was for a, for a global peace pledge. And the form that this could kind of take would be that would be that a group of us who were interested in this could, could maybe meet up and formulate a form of words about the importance of peace and why war is futile and, uh, and, and always um, uh, always finishes in tears to make a kind of global pledge which was then put out uh, into the world and for as many people as possible to sign it. So, so just in the course, this is me being very, very grandiose, but like just imagine one billion people all over the world signing a peace pledge which said worse to the effect that we do not we do not stand by war and wars never happen in our name so i'm just putting that out as an idea things this place seems to spawn things like extinction rebellion and um, um, uh, ecocide movement so things start in this place and so i'm just throwing that, that idea out as an idea which it, if if people are interested in that, maybe you know, come to speak to me and we can see if uh, we can't have someone who's very good on social media, which I'm not, but it would be a, it would be a kind of social media thing to get out into as many places, into as many countries as possible, so that like in 195 countries like, all over the world, there were uh, there were signatories being kind of collected to sign up to a peace pledge, which would then hopefully get into the news, it would become a, a, a new story, and this is a way of of people making their voice heard in the face of these geopolitical sort of power plays that we seem to have no sort of control over whatsoever. So that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think um, let's let's hear uh, let's hear from everybody, and then come come back to questions. And and just whilst you're listening, please. Uh, to the various speakers, if there's stuff that starts to uh, to, to burn on your heart that you want to get out and, and have have some time as well <coughs> to really speak your thoughts, you, you will be absolutely most welcome to, to do so. Um, so if we could turn now to the uh, second uh, speaker, I can't see where he is anymore, but where's Marcus? Oh, you chose me? Okay. <laughs> I didn't really work me. Um, well, I didn't really have uh, anything to say. I'm glad you're here. Um, I don't feel I can speak into this space without remembering my ancestors, my forefathers, who pretty much as far as I can look back in sort of various um, photos going back, you know, we're all soldiers. Uh, you know, my father, uncles, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. Um, and they all fought in quite significant wars. So <clears throat> I don't... So, you know, I see them there looking down on me, talking about um, 
piece. And um, I think, well, you know, there, there has to be some point where it must be right to pick up an arms and defend yourself. Um, and I certainly, you know, defend my position. Um, you know, I would, I would defend it probably, yeah, to the death. Um, so, you know, that, that has to be put out there. We, we, we do have a whole history and, um, and it's in that space that, uh, that I feel I'm standing now. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a new king, and um, it's interesting that he's going to, he seems to be quite keen to swear an oath on defending faith, rather than defending the faith, which of course is the uh, Anglican religion. Um, and I'd, I'd like to know whether he's, well, actually, I'll let, I'll let him swear that oath, because as far as I'm concerned, that he's shooting himself in the foot, because um, um, Thomas Coke, in 1608, also swore an oath um, called Perpetua Unimici, which basically allows the Crown to declare war um, wherever it wants, against whoever, as long as, long as they're not um, fellow Anglicans. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of gives justification to us, to, uh, well, us, not us, um, our nation to declare whatever war we like, quite legally, quite, as far as they're concerned, very justifiably. So, my position actually is to um, abjure from that position, um, and that's a personal decision to um, to not be any part of the, this, these uh, statutes. I, I will obey the law of the land. Um, I'm not going to harm anyone, do any any, any uh, commit you know um, injustice anywhere. Um, and that's an oath I will take uh, in the coming, coming day. I'll, I'll find a uh, notary and I'll swear that oath. Um, well, basically, full swear my nationality, which I, I've never sworn to. Unfortunately, my, um, all my ancestors did swear to defend uh, the crown. Uh, so I will have to probably, I mean, as they're all up there looking down, I'll probably um, have to, you know, unswear their oaths as well, um, and, and and do it on their behalf as well, because they didn't, they did not fight. I don't believe, I know my father and my uncles, I know they did not fight to defend, to defend what I now know, and what, how these wars are now fought. <coughs> they, in all, in all honesty and with the greatest integrity, they fought what they thought were completely just causes. And, it, um, and of course, you know, when I say the rest is history, it is history. Um, can't be undone. Uh, so that's what I want to bring. So, so a couple of things already, um, you know, just in terms of the importance of an oath and understanding, understanding for something, for, for putting it in writing really as to exactly where you are and exactly how you feel. Um, I think just one, one reflection uh, just came to mind about the, the current uh, Russia-Ukraine war. It, it's, the power, it's the power of information and the power of writing. I was on holiday with, with my boys. When uh, when Russia uh, when Russia and Ukraine kicked off, um, and my boy has uh, Instagram social media on his uh, on his device there, and we were, we were just walking down the street, and uh, the news had only broken that morning, and he said, "Look, Dad, I don't understand what's happened here. 
my entire Instagram <coughs> feed is just full of pro-Ukraine, anti-Russian stories, uh, and messaging, and memes. And um, and I must say, he's much more up on that stuff than I am. But um, but we just come out of the of the, the, the COVID situation, and of course. You know, there's been a great deal of messaging and memes and, and things around that particular side of things as well. But he said that it took, it took a long, long time for the memes in particular to be created, to be getting stories across um, uh, and points of view across uh, during the COVID and COVID response. But it was almost instantaneous that his Instagram <coughs> had been fed, uh, filled, sorry, with, um, with all of this uh, messaging. and, and uh, and you know, he was just scratching his head. You know, how, how could this? How could this happen? Because apparently, it it, it, it doesn't ordinarily go. And um, and I guess really, um, pick up on Richard Richard's one there. If there are a, a billion subscribers filling Instagram feeds with uh, "We favor peace, not war," it might well it might well uh, it, it trigger uh, a fine reaction in in in, in some. Um, but I'd like to open the. Uh, the, uh, the floor now to anyone else who'd like to speak. If you could um, raise a hand or catch my eye. <coughs> okay, over to Tony. Okay, so uh, um, <coughs> so my, my name is Tony Gosling. I'm a uh, former BBC reporter. I was working in American High Street in one of the big newsrooms in London for Greater London Radio during the first Gulf War. I followed these things. Uh, I can tell you I'm really appalled at the way these, the BBC is now reporting what's going on around the world in all sorts of different ways. Mm. We, for example, got a guy lived around the corner who'd written a um, biography of Saddam Hussein, got him on the radio to talk about how great the guy was. Now that was journalism back in 1980, no, sorry, 1990. Uh, we also got the uh, campaign against the arms trade on the radio, talking about how we've been selling hawks to Iraq in the, in the years running up to the first Gulf War. And so at least there was a little bit of balance. And I think, you know, we've heard from Mearsheim about Mearsheim. There is a little bit of balance, but very little. <coughs> I want to say a few things about this war, because we keep hearing this whole idea of Ukraine must win, Ukraine can win. Now, this is there's something quite frightening about this, because quite clearly Ukraine cannot win. And so uh, Mishon is right. What's happening is this whole country has been drawn into an unwinnable war. And every day, more and more people are dying mm -hmm. as a result. Uh, so when I was a teenager, I read a book, a Dennis Wheatley book, called The Second Seal. And it really affected me because it was a, a historical novel about mm -hmm. someone who had been trying to stop the First World War happening. They knew that there were plans to start it. And <laughs> He is going around Europe in the run up to the First World War saying, no, 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 we've got to stop this. And he's, he, he even ends up on the train of the generals who are about to stop. <coughs> and I feel a little bit like that, that we, we can see what's happening. This is possibly going to escalate this Ukraine conflict as well. We, we've got nuclear weapons nowadays. So Wheatley kind of put me on the track of it's important to look ahead and to see what are the consequences of our, our actions today. And by, by constantly saying, Ukraine must win. I think we're really on a hiding to nothing with that idea. Okay, they may, but they can't win in this current situation where, where the Russians are trying to build a barrier between, you know, a buffer zone or whatever between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. Really good to hear from Marcus about. I mean, I just, if anyone has ever been in the armed forces here, put your hand up because I'd like to admit that they have. Or even, I was actually a cadet, as a little cadet, you know. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who've got, had experience of this, and if you speak to people who have been in the armed forces, they tend to be very <coughs> sceptical about this war. The only people that seem to be so much for it are um, the media. So there is an organisation, a movement going on at the moment, which has come out of the Stop the War Coalition, uh, moved away from it, called, called No to NATO, No to War. Uh, which is including people like George Galloway, Chris Williamson, who are very much, you know, we need to be just disconnecting from NATO because they're dragging us into an unwinnable war with Russia. Uh, is it legal or illegal? Very good questions. Quite clearly, the Iraq war was illegal. 
Uh, but the legality of this war, if you have a look at the Minsk agreements, it was Ukraine that broke those Minsk agreements by shelling the Donbass region. And so you could also argue that the Russians and the uh, Donbass People's Republic and the rest of them are perfectly in their rights to resume the war because the peace agreement that stopped the original war has been broken by Ukraine and by NATO now as well. Uh, there's a, a general, a Ukrainian general from the Soviet era called Kazimirovich. If you've not seen him, I would definitely go and check him out online. He talks about the, the 2014 coup and he explains that in that coup, it was a CIA coup and it was funded by Viktor Pinchuk, who is the wealthiest oligarch in Ukraine, to so join Israeli-Ukrainian <coughs> citizen. Uh, and he funded it along with a guy called Gatsenyuk, who was then took over as prime minister. And this was a US operation. Anyone that tells you that Ukraine is a sovereign country, it stopped being a sovereign country in 2014. The CIA and the Americans took over control of Kiev, of Ukraine. So Kazimirovich is his name. And he, he takes you through all the names of these people, many of whom are part of one of the big Masonic lodges in Kiev, uh, including Pinchur. Uh, so he's explaining what's going on behind the scenes during that, during that coup. Uh, March, uh, the, in March 22, uh, the Russians uh, found information <coughs> from the signals in Ukraine that the, that the Ukrainian army intended to attack the Donbass. In fact, if you remember, all the troops were massed the Ukrainian army was about to attack the Donbass. That's what the Russians believed. So they preempted that by starting the attack on the Ukrainian army before uh, the invasion of the Donbass by the Ukrainians. Back in April last year, Boris Johnson flew over there uh, to, to call a halt to the peace talks. He promised Zelensky that the whole of the West would be behind him not to make peace with Russia. So a month after the invasion started, there was a very a very successful looking peace negotiation which started in Istanbul, Boris Johnson put a stop to it by promising all the support of the West. And actually, there are some that say that Zelensky's life was threatened too. So I've not you know, seen hard evidence for that. Since then, we've seen the promise of tanks, many tanks. We've seen the promise by the NATO of fighter jets. And we've even seen that the NATO meeting that's about to take place, well, in July this year uh, in um, re, uh, is it Vilnius, I think it is, the uh, Rishi Sunak announced at the Munich Security Conference that they're going to try and change the charge of NATO to allow Ukraine to join, even though Ukraine is in a conflict right now. So this is, this is whether he's just making these empty promises to end the Ukrainians on to keep fighting, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The other, last week we had an attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which was very bizarre because, of course, that's that power plant is controlled by the Russians. So even though the news was, was talking about it as almost <coughs> part of a Russian attack, it can't have been a Russian attack. Why would the Russians bomb their own nuclear power plant? Very, very dangerous thing to any Korean to have done. And during those missile attacks last week, if you go online and have a look around, you may well find some of the articles that I found from the Russian side, which are saying they were taking out parts of the NATO training forces, which were in Ukraine. So the Russians were killing of what they believed was a lot of NATO people already in Ukraine, the command centers. The drone, yesterday's drone, a uh, very uh, interesting story. The Americans saying, please don't fly drones around Crimea. Uh, it looks as if the Russians have come along behind the drone and stuck the, uh, a probe from the front of the aircraft into the propeller on the back of the drone to break the propeller up so that the drone then falls into the sea. So this reminded me, <coughs> actually, of the way that the Spitfire pilots in World War II came up next to the V1s to just flick the, uh, the wing of the V1 to send the V1 into the channel as it was heading over to, towards London. Uh, but this is only one of many crises. We have very many crises, right? We've got an economic cost of living crisis. We've had a COVID crisis. Uh, we've got a migrant crisis. We've got a housing crisis. All I say is, do we see a pattern here? Because the solutions which are being brought as supposed solutions to the crises are making things worse. Uh, all I'll finish with is check out accelerationism. Accelerationism is a philosophy, an ideal which people like Yuval Noah Harari, etc., 
go along with Peter Thiel is another big one, the guy that is behind PayPal. Accelerationism wants to accelerate the collapse of capitalism by helping it collapse, by actually making sure that there is no proper debate and dialogue about how capitalism should end, but to actually force the issue to create a kind of global revolution rather than to allow debate and discussion for things to go. I mean, to make the collapse of capitalism as disruptive and chaotic as possible so that the biggest changes possible can come out of it. So I believe there's a philosophy behind all this. Uh, and particularly with Ukraine, I'm very concerned that this is really a war between NATO and the nuclear power of nuclear armed Russia, which we, uh, you know, could end very nastily. It, and it's not just, it's not just um, scare tactics, is what I'm saying. Because these people really are crazy. The Cuban Missile Crisis, they did, there were people in the US strategic air command that were doing everything they could to start a nuclear war that they believed they could win. So that's my uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Um, well, much to, much to ponder, Tony, that's for certain. And, uh, um, and I'm sure there are many, many more things that could be added to the list, but it, it, it's a very good point, isn't it? The, the crises which we're hearing so much about and the solutions to those crises seem to be creating further crises. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the philosophy behind all of this, I'd be very, very interested to, uh, <coughs> to understand, you know, if, if, if something such as accelerationism or, or, or whatever that philosophy might be, as to how everybody might have bought into it but if they're all um, uh, playing, in the, playing in a similar direction. And, uh, money. <coughs> money. Yeah. You make money. You can make lots of money from the crisis, particularly in economic crisis. You can make a lot of money from war. You're selling arms. Yes, indeed. A lot of this, I think, is just about war. Mm, very interesting. Okay. Please, could you... Uh, let me know if you'd like to speak. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm, <laughs> and, uh, I'm actually going to um, kind of stretch people's patience because I'm going to read something from my wife, Diane Basterfield, um, little known in Stroud, but quite an activist in London who tried to set up a body called the Ministry for Peace um, with John McDonald. And unfortunately, she's recovering from appendicitis and can't be here, but she would love to be here. Um, she would be very alarmed by the thrust of this argument already, because I detect a great deal of misinformation. And uh, I'll, I'll put my own question to the editor of the Commission of the Meeting. Um, anybody who's written, who's read one of the fundamental books on Putin couldn't possibly agree particularly with the last speaker's comments. And I'll just say this, and then I'll go to my wife. If you want to understand Putin, read what he says about Greater Russia and what would be included in Greater Russia. It would be Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And remember that he's already had a go at Chechnya, he's had a go at Georgia, and he's had a go at Moldova. So the idea that Putin is not an imperialist warmonger of the most dangerous sort on a power of Hitler is an absolute nonsense. Now, unfortunately, I can't reference the book that I'm reading on this, but there is a fantastic book um, exploring Putin's roots in the KGB and the KGB's plan to confront the West. And I would defy anybody to talk peace in this context without reading that book. It's the most frightening book I've ever read. And it clearly illustrates that Putin and Hitler are a pigeon pair using the same tactics. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say um, I would go on to my wife's position. But I just felt that this um, had to be confronted before a lot of the messages already been shared in this meeting go broader. Okay, if I can find my glasses, I'll now do what I intended to do, which is to 
read my wife's input. Here it goes. It's, it's a page and a quarter, so apologies. My wife, Diana Bustacle, can't be here tonight as she's recovering from an appendix. And here's what she says. Your leaflet says that you want to bring pressure to bear on political leaders to start jaw-jawing at the earliest opportunity. This is my experience of trying to do just that. In 2003, as pressure was bu building up for the attack on Iraq, I approached John McDonnell and asked him if there was anything civil society could do to stop the war from breaking out. We agreed to jointly campaign for a Ministry for Peace and we held our first meeting in Parliament July 2003. The speaker was Marion Williamson, who was working very closely with congressmen in the United States to set up a US Department of Peace. In October, John introduced a 10-minute rule bill in the House of Commons chamber aimed at creating a Ministry for Peace. The bill had cross-party support from a Tory MP, a Welsh nationalist, a Scots um, nationalist leader, Alex Salmon, and a number of uh, leading MPs, including Jeremy Corbyn. The bill was passed unopposed, but failed because there wasn't enough time to go through the committee stages before the end of the session. When the new session of Parliament opened, the bill was nevertheless <coughs> fully developed and then printed by the House of Commons. The stated aim of the bill was to establish a Ministry of Peace with a function of promoting conflict resolution and the avoidance of military conflict. Over the next seven years, the Ministry of Peace campaign, often chaired by John McDonnell, but sometimes by David Drew when John was unavailable, held many meetings to which experts on conflict were invited to speak. These speakers were all studying war and researching ways to prevent wars in the future. This would include creating values, attitudes and behaviours that address the root causes of violence with a view to solving problems through dialogue and negotiation among individuals, groups and nations. The topics included psychological dynamics of violent conflict, defensive defence or non-offensive defence, human rights as a basis for peace, the conflict resolution process used in Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, the conflict resolution process used in Northern Ireland, the programme of action outlined in 1999, the United Nations Declaration on a Culture of Peace. This included proposals to promote international peace and security, to foster democratic participation, and to advance understanding, tolerance, and solidarity solidarity among indigenous people and traditional groups and to promote international peace and security through action such as working towards disarmament. When the Conservatives and the Lib Dems won the general election in 2010, we decided to shut the campaign down because we did not think any notice would be taken of a campaign to stop war. After such a long education about war and conflict, I have concluded that getting a covered government and many war-supporting voters to agree to take the kind of measures needed to stop war and conflict will take an enormous amount of pressure from civil society and a lot of money. What is your strategy for getting politicians to do or do? None of the experts I listened to ever said that a country should not descend, descend, defend itself sorry, when it's attacked. Ukraine is acting in self-defence and many countries are helping them to do that. This is not warmongering, this is a just war. Do you agree that Ukraine should defend itself? I can put this in, sorry, my... Yes, thank you very much, Candy. Yes, yes, uh, 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 thank you very much. Very welcome mm -hmm. point of view, and, uh, and, 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 and good to hear. Um, just, uh, I mean, you, you, I'd like you to pose that question again, the final one you left us with, uh, Andy, and, and I'd just like to prompt the response 
Well, we can make it already to see, see what people feel to have a conversation with you then. Yes, I mean, my wife would love an answer to that because as a, an experienced peace campaigner, she does take a stance on the Ukraine war and she reads every source and she's come to a considered conclusion that despite evidence being said so far, this is a just war and Ukraine is defending itself. And I would add my piece, you see, where is the Ukrainian voice in this discussion so far? Okay, I think we should be inviting Ukrainians to be part of the group and hear their view, because I believe passionately they are fighting for their independence. And, you know, as a long-term uh, socialist, I cannot do anything other than support them. I think nations have the right <coughs> to, to uh, self-determination. And I can draw parallels with what happened with Hitler when he tried to create Lebensraum. And I think the parallel between what Putin is doing and what Hitler did is exact. Putin believes in a greater Russia. He's gone on record as saying that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union with the added proviso, and I want to rebuild it. Okay. And I think, you know, I would take a stance on that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Just just one, one point of, 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 of order, if I may. Uh, this place is open to absolutely everybody. Um, those who have attended, I, I believe, were made aware of the meeting by a leaflet which was distributed um, to all and sundry who would be interested in taking it. And, uh, and, and, and fundamentally, it was a place where all views are absolutely welcome and all people, groups, are absolutely welcome as well. Um, but Andy, if you, if you wouldn't mind now returning back to the question which you posed at the end of your last letter, uh, if you could just remind us of that question and we can, we can pick it up again. Yeah, I mean, I would like people's view. Do people think this is a just war? If you do, then what is the stance on peacemaking? I mean, actually, I, I, I will, if I could, please, just read you a tiny piece. Of my, this is my contribution, and this is my question. And this is something which actually broke my heart when I read it in The Guardian. Uh, and it's from Raphael Baer a few days ago. And it's about what happened when a small girl in a Russian school uh, drew, drew a, a picture. And it goes like this. Last April, Masha Moskaleva, a 12-year-old girl from the Tula region, south of Moscow, drew a picture in her school art class that upset the teacher. The teacher ran to the head. The head called the police. The police told the FSB, Russia's state security service, which interrogated Masha. Her father, a single parent, was arrested, beaten, fined, and placed under house arrest. His daughter was taken into state care. Moskaleva's crime was discrediting the military, an offence passed into law after the invasion of Ukraine to criminalise dissemination of the truth. It carries a maximum penalty of five years in prison. Her picture showed a woman and a child hand in hand next to a U Ukrainian flag. Missiles fly by towards them from a Russian flag on which is written no to war. Now I did gain, I defy anybody to read that and not take a stance on this war and believe that we are fighting a fascist regime and we're fighting for democracy and the independence of a country that has a right to, to be independent and not used as a buffer state. Somebody's described it as a buffer state. Try saying that to a Ukrainian. My God, what imperialist arrogance. <clears throat> buffer state, that's an imperialist concept where you play big games like at Yalta. Oh yes, you can have this country, we'll have that one. That can stay neutral. 
Austria, it can be a buffer state. Come on, guys, you know. A language being used is interesting in its own right. Absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, that, that, that story I'm sure would touch, um, would, would touch any heart. And, um, and perhaps that's one of the things which is, um, which is very apparent is, is the emotiveness of the, of the situation and, and the reaction that that can prompt uh, in people. Um, and, and if memory serves, your, your, your question was um, about just and justice. Um, and, and is it just for a country to be able to defend itself? And, and I guess by extension, we could possibly even ask, you know, is it just for a person to defend themselves? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know what the best uh, route for there is, Kevin. I think you, you may have had a, 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 your hand up earlier on. Yeah, um, I mean, various, I mean, to, to go back to a very deep uh, historical context um, of the, the Roman Empire, which was the uh, hegemonic power of its day, um, the, this was something I picked up from a podcast by a guy called White Duncan, who wrote a 170-episode um, podcast called The History of Rome, which I recommend to everybody. Um, and uh, I'm working completely from memory, I haven't prepared anything. Um, but uh, part of the uh, Roman uh, religious structure um, was an absolute insistence, uh, remember this is a hegemonic power, uh, an absolute <laughs> insistence that Rome will only ever fight just wars of defence. Uh, now anyone who kind of understands how hegemonic power works um, anyone who knows the history of Rome, uh, you know, what is it, we, uh, we create a desert and call it peace. Um, but uh, every single war that Rome has fought uh, in order to fulfil its uh, religious obligations has had to have the cover of being, no, this is a just war, this is a war of, of self-defence. Um, so they more or less uh, invented, you know, so what they have and what they do is, you know, they kind of go around, the tribe that you want to beat the living out of, um, you know, you find some way to, to rile them, to throw a few stones at you or create some kind of false flag event. And then suddenly, you know, we've, now we've got a just war, guys. You know, this is no longer a war of aggression. This is now a, a war of self-defense, like all of Roman's wars. It's what this hegemonic power, why people keep on attacking it is um, rather mysterious, but, uh, that's been um, that's that's been the way you know things have been done ever since. I mean, I believe there's a very famous quote from uh, I think it was Hermann Goering who said something very similar. He said, "It's always the same. The ordinary people don't want war because they've got nothing to gain from it. So all you have to do is tell them that they're being attacked and denounce them if they uh, as you know denounce them as being in favour of the enemy if they if they prefer peace." You know, so what's the best that the ordinary people can get out of it? To come back alive to their farms. Um, I think that was Herman Goering. So he, he's, you know, kind of echoing this um, Roman policy of making sure that every war, at the very least, has the optics of a just war. Um, so there are, so this is basically, uh, do I believe that the Ukrainians have a right of self-defense? Yes. Um, except we have to say, well, okay, who installed the government which are currently running Ukraine? Or is the government of Ukraine a genuine expression of the Ukrainian people? Um, well, there are good reasons to believe that the government were installed by our current hegemonic power, the USA, uh, with their friends in NATO, um, uh, who also collapsed the Soviet Union through political warfare. We all lived through that. We all saw the Cold War, we all saw how it worked. Um, so, are basically... You, are you denying the, the orange just revolution? Just let me speak. Everyone else has let you speak. Uh, um, so, basically, um, the Ukrainian people have been denied self-defense for centuries. Um, and that is so basically we are looking so the answer is, is so we have to say, well, look, is the current government of Ukraine really a fully legitimate government or is it in the pocket of a hegemonic power? Um, I think that's a very important question and I think that the, you know, the uh, historical record will, will potentially give us some answers to that. 
Uh, we've also got the question that uh, if we accept uh, that, uh, that this is a legitimate government in Ukraine and that they've got a legitimate right to self-defense, uh, we've also got the next question which springs from that is, well, maybe they have, but why is that our problem? Why do we need to get drawn into it? Why are we not helping the Yemenis defend themselves against the Saudis? Why are we not helping the Palestinians help defend themselves against the Israelis? Why did we not stand up with Saddam Hussein and defend him against the Americans? You know, so the question is, it's, like, it's very clear that the Ukraine situation is the current number one order of business in the great game, which has never changed, this game of imperial power politics. And it's not to do with, war does not evolve like a playground fight evolves. War is always about resources. It's always planned. It's always part of a game played by people who are very, very dispassionate, who play to win. And they're all monsters. And you're absolutely right, Putin is a monster. Uh, he, he rose to power through a series of false flag events against his own people, these mysterious bombings against, you know, ordinary poor Russians, which, you know, going through the FSB, which is how he rose to the top. Putin is an absolute monster. He's not a good guy. But the trouble is, they're all like that. Uh, you know, we look at a hegemonic power like America. I mean, here's another question for you. Okay, so you're talking about, suppose Scotland were being lured into a military alliance with Russia. Let's have a look. It's almost, there's a lot of parallels here. It's like we've got the submarine bases in Faisal, submarine bases in Crimea. So suppose, and we do also think that there may very, very easily be, uh, you know, uh, Russian influence in the Scottish nationalist movement, trying to, you know, the same way that we destroyed, uh, we, you know, the same way that the West destroyed the USSR with political warfare, fomented conflict, fomented Vision fomenting this, very, very likely uh, that the Russians have had a large hand in fomenting the Scottish nationalist movement, you know, putting in divisions. So here's a question. Uh, so in the way that Ukraine has been dragged into the Western orbit on the doorstep of Russia, suppose uh, there were political moves by Russia to drag Scotland into the military orbit of Russia. How would London respond to that? Would London just sit there saying, oh, well, of course, they've got a total right of self-determination. I, I really don't think they would. Uh, and also, with regard to the self-determination question, we have to look at the self-determination of the people of the Donbass and the Pans regions. Well, if we are making an absolutist principle of the principle of self-determination, well, why don't we apply that to the bits of Ukraine that want to be part of Russia? So there, there's so much... There's just so much wrong with all of this. And, and you know, the excuses for war, you know, is, if you look at history, it's always been the same. And, you know, you can't talk about saying, you know, oh, yes, uh, and again, this, you know, logical fallacy of the reducto ad Hitlerum argument. It's like, oh, yes, you know, obviously Hitler is exactly the same. And it's like, well, if we take that argument, well, why don't we say the exact same every time America invades somewhere? Oh, my God, they're obviously Hitler. They want to take over the world. We have to stop it. So it's like, when America's enemy does that, Saddam Hussein, obviously the next Hitler, Putin. Obviously, the next step, but you, this is this is the way NATO. Yes. Don't stop, don't stop caricaturing my argument. I'm not. I don't think it's you. It's diabolical caricaturing of my argument. Okay, let's talk about the Spanish Civil War. Which side would you take? Let's talk about the American Civil War. Which side would you take? There are wars that are just, and you are not coming to terms with it. Okay. If I could, uh, if I could just interrupt. Uh, uh, I think the, I, I think, I think we need to accept that there is a concept of justice, and some things are just, and some things are unjust. But I think what we probably won't ever reach agreement upon with everybody around the world at all times as to what is just and as to what is unjust. There's a lot of subjectivity that will go into that, a lot of personal experience, a lot of our understanding and our worldview, uh, the things that we grow up, the things that we understand. Um, but it's a very, very, um, I think, fundamentally important question um, as to whether or not we are able to remove ourselves objectively to be able to evaluate whether or not 
one party is naturally presumed to be obeying the rules and within the law, and one party is naturally assumed not to be, or whether we have to apply the precise same measurements and criteria uh, across the board if it were possible in some form of objective, uh, objective fashion. Um, I'd just like to open up the, the, the conversation to, uh, <coughs> to, to others who may wish to, uh, to bring something. Yes, Would you please. like to hear uh, possibly from a person who knows the situation, not from the books and newspaper, but from someone who has been there? Yes, please. Uh, or saw the people who were there? Um, I was born in the Soviet Union and I spent half of my life in Russia and half of my life um, in the UK. Sorry, UK. UK, 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 yes. Um, um, it's unlikely that you will find a Russian person who doesn't have a Ukrainian blood in them or other blood, Georgian blood. Uh, because um, in the Soviet Union, uh, there was a mixture of nations and our blood is so interlinked. Uh, so it's almost impossible to, um, to separate it now and take Ukrainian blood, Russian blood out from our bodies. Uh, my mother, she spent um, part of her life in Donbass when she was young, studying in a school in Donbass. And um, when the war started in Donbass, uh, we were greatly involved in it because this is where her schoolmates were. Was that in 2014? Yes, yeah. yes. This is where her schoolmates were, this is when she started when she was a young girl. So what was the options for them? Some of the people from Donbass, they made a choice to come to Russia. And my family was looking after some of um, them, trying to find a safe place for them to be. They came literally with nothing because their homes were invaded in Donbass. Part of people decided to stay and fight in Donbass. Majority of my mom's mates stayed there, fighting for the freedom of the bus. Um, some are on, in, in Russia now, alive, but a lot of who stay, she, yeah, they're all dead. But they said, we will stay there, we will fight for our land in the bus. And one by one, my mom was receiving information how her schoolmates were dying. Um, um, what I heard from uh, Richard and another speaker um, is something that I hear, although I'm trying to stay away from the politics, but my first education degree is in politics, in fact, in government and state um, administration, municipal administration. Um, so I know a little bit of the politics from studying for six years in the university. And um, what is happening now is um, The people who understand the fruitless of war, we know that uh, how many people are dead already. Uh, I've chosen to stay away deep in the village, away from the this central system and what is governing all these wars. But now, <laughs> men from Russia, young boys, the, the all they're fighting war for, you know. One by one, we see the news about the deaths of our boys on both borders, Ukrainian 
and Russian. I don't define Ukraine in Russian because, because I cannot, you know? It's impossible. And this war which brought up not five people, and there are casualties and death on, on each side. And, and it's, it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. For both Ukraine and Russia. <coughs> and what is bad is we are fed by hatred and the <laughs> they clashed us into this feeling of hatred which um, is what is um, behind it. Um, my mm, Martish is to keep my inner peace, inner peace, so when <laughs> the war is over, it is for us to help these people to come back to life and restore the peace in their hearts, in their families, on both sides. It doesn't matter, Ukraine and Russia. So I, I, I personally do not divide it. Um, uh, and I came today, <laughs> first I thought, no, 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 I'll stay away from the politics in this war. <laughs> But it's impossible in a way. So how can we help it? Hatred cannot help to stop the war. And if you know how, perhaps you can say. Thank you very much. I think a very, a very, very timely reminder of the people element to all of this and the incredible shock and tragedy which is going on um, uh, at the moment. So thank you very much indeed for, for bringing that. And I just returned from Russia uh, a week ago. And um, obviously uh, now when you travel through um, countries, and I was speaking to my children in Russia, all you hear bloody Russians, bloody Russians, um, like almost if uh, I had to protect my children so they stay safe in Finland. <clears throat> so, yes, I am for peace. <laughs> I am for peace, and this is where we should be inner peace and outer peace. We, we cannot find the peace through hatred. <laughs> I came on to make a small point um, in response to people saying that they hate Christians. Could you possibly speak up? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, but I only want to make a very small comment. Richard and I had the good fortune of going to Russia a few years ago, and we were welcomed by everybody we met. They were very sincere, warm, beautiful, lovely people. And they were very devout Christians, and they, that was very, very evident. And, and I just, my heart breaks because it's not about politics, it's about power and greed. It doesn't matter who you think is liable or who's on the right, just side. This is not a just, there's no justice here because this is a war about dark powers actually i believe that this is about dark and evil forces that are behind pu pulling the puppet strings um and i'm sorry to say that there's casualties on every side and i i couldn't possibly come to any conclusion on is this just no it's all injust it's, there's absolutely no justice here and i think as a people group we need to unite, uh, forget about the politics, we need to think about humanity and about love. And love 
is the highest power. It has the vibration, it has the life, it has energy, the universe is full of it. And as a people, we can connect. And I, and I thank you, Richard, for sharing your vision, because we do need to all stand up and say, not in our name. You know, I'm a mother to children. I'm, I'm hopefully going to be a grandmother. I care about everybody. That's why I'm out on the street with my fellow friends, taking abuse every Friday from people. Because it's not about us, it's about the greater good of mankind. And I'm passionate, and my fellow friends are passionate about our fellow man. And we've been pitted against each other for 15 years. There's been psyops where we have, you know, what used to be little disagreements, oh, I used to vote for the dick side of it, Labour. You know, that's all just, everything is set up now for us to be in opposition to one another. Whether that's if you voted Brexit, if you voted this, what you think about that, mm -hmm. what sort of car you drive, whatever it is, <coughs> the something has been happening in 15 years which makes people intolerant. We're supposed to be so tolerant, there are government policies about it, when it's actually the reverse. We're the most intolerant group of, probably in history. Um, and we need to wake up to what's going on. You know, what is going on? That's the question we should ask ourselves. Who's profiting from the war? Follow the money train, and you always get an answer. It's about power and greed, and we can say no. And I'm glad that we've started this discussion group tonight because it's a start. At least we're doing something rather than nothing, sleeping through it. Thank you. Thank you. A tiny little thing, just uh, sorry, just this is a tiny little quote from Bertrand Russell. Um, he said, uh, What is it? Uh, War does not determine who is right, only who is left. <laughs> and I think that's. Uh, yeah. Can you take the light off of it? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to understand when you talked about the choices that people had to make yes. in the Donbass. Yes. And you talked about, because I'm aware that there are different narratives as to who invaded who. In, in the, so can you just, in your, in your view, what was the sequence in the Donbass in 2015? I'm trying to stay away from politics yeah. and go, although what I hear <coughs> is not dissimilar to what I... Um, I don't want to say believe, but you know. If you don't want to answer the question, it's um, what, what what I've seen, you know, uh, what I've seen, you know, people who were not invaded, they would not come to us barefoot. There's nothing on leaving their houses. The war started. They were invaded in Donbass. From which side? From which sides do you think? <laughs> well, we are told. Some sides, which has been. Um, invaded. Who was above it? I'm not discussing it. Uh, who organized it? Who ordered it? I don't know. But they were intruded into their land. Armies, they had to flee from Donbass. Option flee or stay and find <coughs> their own homes. So those who decided to leave everything, they made choice. Uh, maybe they had younger kids, they made a choice, like we have the families coming um, to live with us. Um, they've made a choice not to stay and guard, they left everything, but a lot of people stayed and fought till the last breath. They did not get their independence immediately like they wanted. They said, we will okay. stay and fight for our independence in the West. I understand that, but I think uh, it's important, very important to realize that you are talking, I think, about 2014, not about 2022. Exactly, that's the one when it started. Yes, yes. Can I say something like that? Yes. Back in 2014, if you remember, Israel was bombing Palestine, absolutely completely flattened the place. And for months and months, I watched in horror on the internet what's happened. And I was talking to Palestinian youngsters in the in the night because they'd been messaging at the time, say is anybody awake because they were scared, they could hear bombing. And I talked I talked with them online about their 
university courses and so on. And while, while I was talking to the Palestinians, a lot of news started coming through about the bombings in Donbass. And, and I watched with horror what was going on there. And I watched films of people, like this lady was saying, trying to defend their properties and, and being bombed and, and being hit. And they're showing all that the destruction in their places, which was not as bad as Palestine, but it still looked pretty bad. And, and the, the, the films I watched from people who stayed and tried to, to save Donbass, um, at the time there was a video released. It was still, it was still online, I, it took me ages to find it last time, but it's about why Putin didn't go in and act to save, <coughs> save Donbass at the time. And it's basically, it's, it, it's saying that if he had, he knew it would draw the whole of Europe into a war and there would be mass deaths and he didn't <coughs> want that to happen. So he tried not to, not to be aggressive about the fact that Donbass was being attacked at the time. Your point about the memes, well that year there was actually a meme that came out at Christmas and I remember this because there was, a, there was a joke that came out, and I think it was in Off Guardian or something like that, and it said, um, and it was just after Christmas, it said, breaking news, um, Santa got shot down over the North Pole. Who did it? Putin, source, media. I remember that came out at the time, because I thought it was really funny. I remember telling my brother, because we were both very interested in world politics, and then my brother drowned the next day, and so that's why I remember it because it's all that summer was that whole year was just very emotional, and you know, and this this lady talking, I you know, I remember it. It's like it was yesterday. Um, there was another point I was going to make. It's about the memes. It was about the. It was about the fact that I was watching that whole that whole summer about and, and seeing the aggression that was going on in Donbass, and and and. I, you're about to change of the government and so on. So that year was just, it was horrific. It was a bit like watching our pandemic and everything. It kind of, it, it moved you inside to, to see it because these were just just normal people whose lives have been completely turned upside down. I remember saying to people at the time about Palestine that, you know, you think this is all over there, but it's going to happen to all of us eventually. We don't stop anything. And the other thing that, Putin, that was said by the Russians about, Putin not, not getting involved in Donbass was because that after what would happen that if Europe got pulled into this war, it would make a lot of money for the American uh, mil uh, providers of military equipment and then America would rise again and become an even worse power. That was the reason that they gave that he didn't invade, he didn't do anything about it at the time because it would only strengthen America. But I think ultimately that something had to be done because, because there was slaughter going on. Yeah, this is what um, the gentleman said as well, that the reason this document was released and came, that is what is believed, you know, that the NATO wanted to start invasion, and yeah. we supposedly found out about 24, 24 hours before that there was kind of no choice as to <coughs> start defending. Sorry, I, but really I, again, you know, I can I can assume that it can raise the, the questions, and um, you know there can be opposition. So I'm trying not to involve into the politics. And uh, can I, I just say that this story is so distorted, and you're not hearing the other side. We're not talking about the Orange Revolution. We're not talking about what happened in Belarus. What happened in Ukraine, and this is my point of view, and it's uh, based upon a recent book I read, is that in 2014 there was an election in which the pro-Russian leader uh, was, was, was elected by a completely manipulated poll. The Ukrainians then went on the streets to such an extent that they had to rerun the election. The pro-Western leader who won the election was poisoned and had to be rushed to the West to save his life. He then took over. Okay, so 
If you start punctuating from that point, you get a completely different view of what happened. In other words, what I'm saying, I don't want to go into the details after that, as long as there was a kind of puppet regime pro-Russian in Ukraine, Putin was happy. When the Ukrainian people had a relatively clean poll and said, we want to join the EU and we want to look towards the West, this did not go along with Putin's plan for Greater Russia. So he intervened, he poisoned a leading Ukrainian leader. Okay, you had the people on the streets. Did you not watch your televisions at the time? Have you not ha seen what happened in Belarus when the when the Belarus puppet won his election? There was a massive revolution of people on the street fighting for democracy. Okay, the Donbas separatists were a separatist movement. Okay, a pro-Russian. A backed by Russia's separatist movement. So other Ukrainians said, we don't like the idea of a big chunk of our country um, being taken by the Russians, and we're going to fight. Now, you either believe in the right to self-determination for a whole country, or you use the Hitler type garden. Oh, in the Sudetenland, there's a majority of German-speaking people. So I think they should join Germany. And you can even use the democratic argument and say, oh, there's a majority in Sudetenland to join Germany. Therefore, Germany has the right to take it. That is the politics of madness. And it does no standing in international law at all. You know, I, I, I would respectfully say to this meeting, you should start talking about Ukraine when you've read some fundamental history about the Ukraine. Where did you get from? Where did you get from? Where did you get yours from? The light. Yes, I'm putting it now. 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 I'm
I think uh, your wife did a, a tremendous effort uh, in those, what is it, 12 years? Uh, uh, oh, about seven or eight, yeah. Well, because uh, through Parliament and, my God, uh, I really heard the, the tremendous effort. <laughs> and But maybe, um, this is my point of view, the struggle that, that, that she had to go through was to raise the human element within the politicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I, I really, well, uh, chapeau, as they say in English, <laughs> to your wife, <laughs> uh, that, that, to try to find that human element. And I think that uh, should be part, uh, in my opinion, part of that pledge. Because I think the, the people that sort of uh, um, are also involved, um, yeah, I, I look at it more from the reincarnation side of things as well, <laughs> so making it a bit uh, complicated uh, for some people. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, yeah, so I, th I think because there's so much heart I, I feel in, in this uh, circle of people, uh, and I think that's what we need to point the finger to rather than. Um, this is my country, or, or you, you mentioned uh, uh, the faith, or faith. Uh, as soon as it becomes, uh, then I think it becomes dodgy. So uh, I like uh, the human element, so that we can't use uh, that Holland is actually the best country in the world. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. Thank you very much. And um, if I could... I suggest we take a break on that uh, on that note, uh, gather some refreshments uh, uh, and thoughts, and uh, thank you very much for reminding of yeah. the, uh, the very important human and, uh, yeah. and compassion that we all need to be shared. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank all the speakers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and your wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there is a very, very interesting point, aren't you? In the foyer up here, it's like a uh, drink.
working with this person two years ago. Where was you praying to be careful? Would you be bothered to pick up the phone? But now,
it was against everything that I sort of professed. But it was just beyond me. It was deeper and more beyond me. Yeah. And I just, uh, I must watch that. I mustn't let it yeah. invade me. Or um, It was just an extraordinary experience. Mm -hmm. I was seeing somebody driving down the street in a limousine and a silk suit and over a rough part of London. And it's just because it was um, it's been visibly alien that had all the trappings of wealth and power. It's just extraordinary. And I think that's, um, you know, I mean, I think of people like Putin of power. I didn't know the way they think they've been taken in, that they're juggling with forces that I, I dark <laughs> because I can't handle them. <laughs> And uh, the, point, the point was made before, before the break as well, wasn't it? There's a spiritual uh, yeah. dimension to it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to give any of their insights or thoughts about uh, spirituality in this, in this type of conversation or what spiritual dimension at all. Well, I would say that um, I think a lot of the uh, problems of the world regarding these, these wars that seem, seem to be recurring and that we don't actually learn anything from um, is, is a lot to do with the, the etymology and the language that is used by um, the people who wage the wars. Um, by not um, raising our voices or, or, or by, by not saying anything, it's a form of tacit consent, which is what they're using law courts as well. Um, for you to agree to, to what they're saying. Um, so a lot of um, all of these wars and all the problems that we're, we're facing um, come from the fact that um, if we don't give us our, our consent to them, um, they can't do what they want to do. And uh, I think a lot of you know that I'm on the, the high street with uh, the Info Hub and uh, I do think that that is the most effective way of passing on messages to, to people from person to person um, uh, is through that, it's, it's through community, it's through talking to people face to face and um, imparting information. They might not agree with that information, but that information may well sow a seed of doubt um, from the paradigm that they've been enveloped by through programming and programming obviously is, is massive through the mainstream media at the moment. Um, there's a lot of pro propaganda from both sides saying that the, the Russians are innocent in this. Um, but the experience that I had in this country looking at the, the, the mainstream media, the Western mainstream media, it's full of lies, it's full of deceit, it's uh, full of tricky use of words in, in order to get people to go along with the narrative um, and yeah from a spiritual point of view um, that's, that's I, I see it as, as programming they're programming us into doing things so could you just clarify you said programming by both sides i'm sure the media in russia uh, okay does the same thing. yeah and of course, in some parts of the world, religious fanaticism is the cause of much warfare still in the world. Not so much in this country, but uh, in Ireland we've had it, haven't we? Um, factions, Christian factions, fighting each other. So we're not guiltless here either, are we? Yeah. I think it's it wasn't just a, a religious thing in, in, in Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland but no. there was a lot of a lot of religion too. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it was partly. Yeah. I blame my ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there's there's something which it hasn't it hasn't quite been mentioned and it's quite difficult to mention it because it doesn't exist really for, for, for most people's consciousness. I'm not saying here, but 
in general, and that is that we've got this, we've got, we've got this twofold thing. This, you know, this side the West and this side Russia and Putin or whatever, whatever it might be, China, and we've constantly got to. That has been mentioned, but what's difficult is is to sort of flesh out a middle sphere between them. We're just constantly given this too. We're pulled into it, and how can we make the middle kind of real <laughs> and, and in in the sort of geopolitical, which I don't, I'm not trying to be um, provocative with geopolitical, I mean literally, you know, the geography of the world, which also relates to politics. Um, in this, if we go to, if we go to, or for you it's the other way around, but if we go to America, you know, we go to Russia, there's a middle, yeah? There's a middle between there, which happens to be Europe, Ukraine's pretty much, you know, connected to that middle, but there is a middle. And, um, it's something that's happened in history that that middle's been kind of wiped out. And, and I wanted to, to run an event, we may do, we may not, but it was the one, one part of it was called the forgotten heart of Europe. Because, because that's the case. You know, if you go back 200 years or so, just to the German speaking world, not only to them, and you've got this just profusion of, of Novalis and Schiller and Goethe and the philosophers and Hegel and the musicians, the whole thing. You know, I'm not saying that's the only thing. You see this incredible culture, which, yeah, we had our culture there, but it's something else. And which, which could have done something and wanted to do something, not, not warring at all. Say, look, there's something else that can come forward. And it's how, how can people remember that? Because... Um, It's, no, but it's interesting, it's coming into people's questioning now over the North Street. Um, you know, perhaps you heard this, uh, this ex weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, who, who was really, really shocked at, at Germany. You know, when, you know, whether you agree with it or not, when, when, when it came out, when Seymour Hirsch publicized that America had been responsible for North Street. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting what Scott Ritter's response was, because it was like, what's Germany doing? How can it, how can it accept that? It's just saying, okay, <laughs> so just, you know, wipe out this whole connection and, you know, do even well, clarification. When you said America is responsible for Nord Street, could you just clarify what you mean? Well, well um, I don't know if you're aware of this article that came out by the yeah. journalist. Seymour Hirsch, because he ended up publishing it on Substack, you know, yes, you know Seymour Hirsch. I'm, so. I'm guessing what you're talking about is the detonation that... Yes, yeah, the sabotage. Yes, yeah. sorry, yeah. it was just very unclear. Absolutely, the, the, the blowing up of the yes, North Street. Of America, sorry, right, which is, the, you know, the right. gas, basically, you know, <clears> my knowledge is great, but between Russia and yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're Europe using, and Germany. Yeah, so you're just saying North Street as a, as a shorthand for that event rather than... For yes, I apologize, I apologize. Yeah. And then this article came out, which had a huge amount of publicity, you know, with very detailed research. He didn't say who his source was, but he, mm -hmm. he said he had a major source. It was very detailed. The description of how you know that it was run from America, the, the blowing up of this pipeline. I'm not trying to get into a debate about it or to say whether it's true, but it was very interesting that um, that that Scott Ritter has <laughs> said that the, the whatever he's called, the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, was in America with Biden when Biden actually just made the statement, we will blow up, we will finish. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And Scott Ritter said, Well, how can Schultz do that? How can he just say, Okay, <laughs> you just, you know, carry out economic sabotage on, on our country? So that, that can get a bit hot, and I don't want to do that. But what I think is interesting <clears throat> is that he's saying, you know, his view is that Germany should, should pull out of NATO, and other countries should pull out of NATO and have their own voice. You know. Not for the sake of war, for having a different voice. Saying, we're here. Let's not just get into this tit for tat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one can say a lot about it, but I just think, well, my own view is that it's not going to happen at the moment in the political sphere because the politicians in Central Europe are basically <laughs> Westerners. You know, they're just agreeing with a Western approach on the whole. 
maybe you disagree, sir, but you know, some may be joining Putin, but on the whole, there's a sort of dualism. Um, so the politicians aren't saying we can have a different approach to what people are saying here. Can the middle come in? Can we actually have a heart? And it is the heart reach in the middle. It's like, do we just have this, or, or is there a heart region? And the, and the, the, the countries, the, the leading politicians are not going to do it. But I think it's interesting if we can kind of advocate for that. One is aware, hang on a minute, you know, what about this, this part of the world, this part of the world? <laughs> what about that, you know, rather than just this? Mm. So, I think that um, George W. Bush's famous quote, you know, this, where you're not, you know, the middle is to kind of, to, to be destroyed. And his, you know, his quote is, if you're not with us, you're against us. And, and you know, but even back when he said that at the time of the Iraq war, I thought, well, okay, if that's how you want to play it, I'm against you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not not where we'd all rather be. We'd all rather be in that middle space where we're not forced yeah. to choose between mm -hmm. great powers, equal, medieval. You know, we want to. Well, that's right. That's right. I mean, recently it was, it was yeah. some connection with this event. I can't remember how, but Marcus said to me. You know, I just want the yes or no answer. And I remember saying to you, you know, you're not going to get one, I'm afraid. You know, I'm not doing yes or no. <laughs> Which is okay. You know, we, we, we stand and we try to understand. So, and that's what can maybe help. The Zen answer to that is this thing of uh, new, which is like, a, give me a yes or no answer. And the answer is like, new, which is like, no, please unask the question because it, it's not. Doesn't lend itself to the yes or no. Very good. Yeah, I think when we speak about the middle, <clears throat> we also have to understand what the middle really is. Um, you know, because in this, there has also been a politics of the middle. To think of Tony Blair yeah, and what has that created. Yeah, so uh, a middle is not just 50% of one thing and 50% of the other, but it's something completely new, completely created. Like, you know, a child is not just a mixture of the, of the uh, DNA of the, of the parents, but it's a unique being in its own right. And I think it's very important to understand that. When, when we mix black and white, we get gray. But if we take black and white and look through a prison, we get this amazing phenomenon of color when you see a rainbow, for example. And, and so this whole sort of creativity is always something that's pushed out when we come into the binary world. It's pushed out of education, it's pushed out of adult education, it's no longer valued. And that's the true middle. That is actually where we learn to be in the middle space. Mm. <clears throat> and you, you know, you were quite, quite right to point to this um, culture of philosophy, but also art in, in that middle space, and music, and, and <coughs> all of that. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, recently I watched um, a video about um, a singing protest in Estonia when people weren't allowed to say certain things. And what people did, they came together, they um, had to use certain words for the singing because they weren't allowed to really say what they wanted to say, but the lyrics Some and the, 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 sorry, the music, thank you, the, the passion with which people came together and sang brought the government down, you know? Right. And, and it's that powerful, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? It's that powerful. And dictators have always been afraid of the artists, yeah? They, they um, only allowed certain art forms, which weren't actually really art forms, <laughs> To, uh, to be brought to expression and, and people were, you know, said this is degenerate art, we can't have that. And we are actually in our own culture, in our own country now, going in that direction. You're not allowed to say certain things. Um, the creative parts are taken out of education. Children have to just kind of learn to function as 
citizens and and also what, what uh, was said earlier, you know, one is just pitted against each other because when two people come together and have a conversation from the heart space, it is amazing what can happen. And it is much more than one and one are two. There's much more happening than, than, than that. I've been exploring that today. Karen, I've been doing a training in what's called Open Dialogue and it's using psychiatry. And it's all about creating a safe space where any, any words from the family, the patient in crisis, and two trained facilitators, all on an equal level. And anything in that, in that liminal space of uncertainty, anything is allowed to be expressed. And in Finland, the studies are incredible. This has been done over several decades. We've done a study recently in the UK where patients are now the um, cut the medication and hospitalization rate by massive 70%. <coughs> because that space, that creative space is allowed whatever needs to be revealed to be held. And I believe, I've, I've been shocked by it. I, I believe now that we've had we've been under we've been under attack, I believe, from media, our politicians, and we've been the divisions have been created between us, and that's broken my heart. I see the censorship, the things that we're not allowed to say, mm. open debate is not allowed, even in Parliament. Andrew Bridgen has really highlighted that recently. He's one person, um, um, the other, other right. people have tried to put their head above the parapet and actually ask for a, a mature debate on any issue, and we're being suppressed. Mm. What is going on? And this, these are the questions we need to ask. And, and I feel uh, for the young people, I witnessed uh, an explosion in mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Young people are really suffering. Where are the adult, the real uh, role models in society now for these children <coughs> to have as their guides to show them how to resolve conflicts, to show them healing ways forward, to yeah, you know, to create peace. You know, so what I'm doing is the microcosm. I work for the World College of Psychiatrists, and, I, and I'm. You know, so privileged to be training in this uh, there, this uh, way of working with people, but this needs to be happening everywhere. We're creating these safe spaces for free speech and with respect and acknowledgement and non judgmentalism. And that's spirituality in action. Yes, I believe that's so. That's important spirituality. It's not sort of something added on. Yeah. That's sort of illusory. That's really where it's at. Yeah. That's not an abstract thing. <clears throat> and there's, there's something I'd like, like to add to what Richard said also, and that is, you know, we grew, we grew up in the time of the Cold War, when there was the Iron Curtain, and you had, you had the Soviet Union, you had the West, I mean, completely this, this two-sided thing, and uh, it looks like that's what's going to happen again now as a result of this Ukraine, this Ukraine conflict, but in between, there was an opportunity, and this opportunity was actually presented by Gorbachev at the time, where, where, where he came along and said, uh, he, he let go, I mean, let go, okay, he let go the Warsaw Pact countries to be, to be independent. He said, you, you do that, this is my gesture, which will offer a space. So it was like a kind of gesture of create a space so that something positive can emerge, you know? Um, and the West was a bit, didn't know what to do for a while until, until suddenly the, we're going to spread into the East and the whole thing ended. But, you know, that gesture of actually I will make a space and let something emerge could have allowed this independent common European home, as he called it, to emerge as the new Europe, which could have been a balance between East and West. You know, but of course that wasn't allowed. But the fact that it happened once, I think, offers a scope, a face of hope that one day it can still happen. It's interesting that there's a, um, that there's a, there's a story um, that, as far as I know, it's actually true, that in the 1990s, um, uh, Putin um, um, approached Bill Clinton and said to him that he would be interested in Russia joining um, NATO. And 
um, Clinton just laughed, turned his back and walked away. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very relevant to what you're, what you're saying. Okay, thank you guys. It's, um, it's approaching 9.30, so we'll be chatting up in a, in a few minutes. Um, is, is there any other points that anyone would like to make? Just one more thing. The corporations haven't actually been mentioned much uh, last evening. Um, we're talking about nations and leaders and personalities. Um, personally, I think it goes a bit deeper than that, and it is actually the, the, the corporations behind these leaders. You know, at the, the political, said many times that people like Boris Johnson and uh, Joe Biden, look at Joe Biden, he's a puppet, you know, the, the, the Boris Johnson, the clown, Jester, you know, in, in the House of Parliament. These people are being told, that are being dictated to from some, somewhere above them, if you follow the money, um, and that is um, all of this, uh, that we are corporate entities through our legal fictions, our names. And um, when you join that um, with them in that court of law, you are um, basically, yeah, kissing your ass goodbye because that's it, they got you there. Um, so that going back to sort of the corporatization of everything, including us and our names, is something we should all be wary of and, and looking into as a means of, I don't consent. Yeah, I do not consent to what you are telling me to do. Can I just say one sort of thing? Sort of vaguely related to this. Um, we can, I hear a lot the word transparency being called for in the media and, and reporting. And um, um, we're told that Pfizer applied for their files to be secret for I think it was 150 years from the seventy five. Oh, well, it's 75. Um, the Supreme Court said no, they couldn't. Uh, we have a Freedom of Information Act, it can be quite hard to do it. I've heard of secret files in this country being kept on the NHS and, and social services. Um, and I was in a U3A group where we were discussing something. I can't remember what we were discussing. But someone else out of the room started turning the Germans to bits in relation to the Second World War and what went on then. So I thought, well, I'm going to make someone in this room that I know squirm. And I said, hang on. It's important to know, since the fall of the GDR and the reunification of Germany, the Germans have opened up their secret files to public inspection, and anyone who thinks they've been spied on, reported on, slugged, libeled, can go to the old um, starting headquarters and apply to read their file there, and then confront anyone that they didn't put it in and say, what did you do it for? What was in it for you? What did you get out of that? And that's about what undermining and stabbing the individual in the back and you know, stands up and deviates who doesn't fit the mold, I don't know. Um, but I think that's something like that. I've read it in two places that the Germans have opened up their secret files. Um, and, and I think Japan is another one that gone very much for peace as nations. In Estonia, there's a law which enables you to go to the government and get them to open up every piece of information that they have on you, including everything that's on the internet. So there are models in certain countries. Where, Estonia. Yes, I think it's Estonia, where you can actually, as a citizen, have rights to information which is normally in Norway. You can go down to your local tax office and find out how much your neighbour pays in tax. So there are models you know, throughout the world where you can find back. Well, it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting line we're going down, and and you know there's a lot there's a lot within this particular space. And when it comes to suppression of information or censorship or being unable to 
have a conversation whereby you can consider both sides and maybe even consider what the middle might be. Um, but there's a lot of pushing against that at the moment. And, and I think one of the things which can be, well, very early on someone mentioned about legality and illegality. But I think to a certain extent, there's a very big need for the rule of law to still be, to still have some form of purpose um, in the country. Therefore, Freedom of Information Act requests or citizen access requests or, or, or what have you are proven very successful, albeit slightly long-winded, to actually get to, to get to the information which, which people are, are, are needing to get to. Um, but, you know, what you talked tonight about division and, and, and divisiveness from 15 years ago and what happened then, and of course what happened then, you know, media changed with, with, with internet, with social media, etc, etc, etc. Over the years, that's moved into algorithms, and, and the algorithms now are, are, are moving very much into artificial intelligence and machine learning, which now is creating new phenomena such as open AI and chat GBT, etc, etc, etc. And, and really, I think when you look in the direction of travel that these things are going in, a machine only learns from the data with which it ingests. Okay, there's an old adage, a failed IT project, which is garbage in, garbage out. Now, if you think about machine learning, if it's ingesting, it's what it's ingesting in order to get to the answers that it's getting to, in order to give you the answers that it's giving you. And if the information which it, which it is ingesting is not of a, a balanced, overarching viewpoint, then necessarily there'll be bias in the, in the answer that which it gives you. Now, just on this point, um, sorry, I've, taken, I've just gone on with here, haven't I? But I mean, on this point, um, there's, there are a, a number of concerns around the direction of travel of these things, and, and, and it's not surprising, um, because uh, someone like Zuckerberg, for instance, stood in front of the committee and said his duty wasn't to people, his duty was, was the algorithm, you know, and when we come back to humanity and spiritual diversity and things like that, you know, binary, you mentioned earlier on, I know that's in a different context, but binary, of course, is one and a zero in every computer program, that's what code breaks itself down into. And, and essentially, the, um, the the Artificial Intelligence Act, for instance, that the EU is coming out with in, 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 in due course, and uh, the states, has a fundamental element to it, to protect fundamental human rights. Okay, fundamental human rights. So then, then we can then go and have a look at what fundamental human rights actually are, and what constitutes that legislation, the statutes, the common law, and the natural law, as well as everything else. Um, and really, um, because we've had in this last uh, tranche here just these, these wins about people asking for the FDA to release the files, not in 75 years, but in much, much less than the judge having to do that, people bringing constitutional law action against those who are not doing just things. Um, there are these wins, and, and it, it does give, I think, some hope there that we can, um, if geared up correctly with the right arguments and with the right law, we can at least make these stands um, for the fundamental protection of human rights, uh, not just for our generation, but for those generations which, which, which come, come hereafter. And I mean, I guess, you know, without in any way meaning to sort of hijack the last five minutes of, 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 of the day, um, it, it, I, I value, uh, Richard, uh, uh, anyone else, um, whether it might be a useful topic of conversation or a starting point, perhaps, for another, for another get-together to, to just talk about these freedom of speech items, to talk about these middle grounds, to talk about yeah. how we might be able to just extend the conversation back out, to remove this level of divisiveness which right. Helen talked about uh, earlier on today. I'd just like to, I mean, it's an interview I did a few years ago with a former US intelligence officer. Uh, he talked about hardening the sides. If people have heard that expression before. And it's what they do through the press hardening to get a war going. Hard hardening the sides. The side. Hardening the sides. sides. So forcing everyone to choose yeah. which side are you on. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a psychological warfare technique that's used you know, during, for example, I think it was a the Vietnam War, they really developed it. But uh, the idea is that everybody has got to have an opinion on this one way or the other, and not, you know, not have both sides, really. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think, you, when you were talking about the corporation, yeah. I thought you were going to go into this whole business, that brilliant Canadian film, The Corporation, which goes into the fact that these corporations now own almost everything, including land, resources, 
patents, uh, and that they're immortal. Media. Media, of yeah. course. And they're immortal, actually. Most of the other media, of course, is in the, the actual assets are in tax havens, so they're not paying any tax. Yeah. We've just had a budget today where we're running loads of inflation. And um, it's a hilarious situation. We haven't actually had any increase in the threshold for taxes. So for companies, corporation tax, they've not increased the threshold for that. They've not increased the threshold for personal tax. What they're doing is they're making, they're making all this song and dance about trying to get people into work, whereas they're making work pay less mm -hmm. in the budget. So this is what I'm, I suppose I mean about the accelerationism, is we're being sold a pup on almost every single topic out there. And this is why I try and do what I do uh, with my radio program, if I can plug that, which is thisweek.org.uk every Friday. And one of the things we'll be looking at this week is a brand new piece of news I haven't seen anywhere else about Ukraine, get back to the topic, which is about the use of depleted uranium in Ukraine, depleted uranium shells in some of the you know, armoured battles that have been taking place because we've got some new information through from freedom of information requests uh, showing that the actual levels of radiation in British, British atmosphere has doubled over a lot since the beginning of the war. So this 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 is uh, uranium that gets out, particles get out into the atmosphere and they get to blow around the world. Uh, and, they, and, and, and the scientists I interviewed believe it's almost certain that the uh, th there are depleted uranium shells being used all the time now over the Ukraine, as a matter of course. It used to be a dark cloud. Can I just say, uh, can I just say very quickly that it would be great uh, if we were to meet again, and I'm sure the group will, will discuss that, and if we decide to do that, we'll, we'll kind of create a leaflet and we'll put the leaflet out again, and, you know, and like, we're all welcome here to, to carry on having this conversation. Just and, and, and to say that uh, the idea about about a, a global peace pledge. Several people have come up to me and said that they would really like to run with that. <clears throat> and someone suggested that perhaps it could be launched on World Peace Day, which is the 13th of September. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so if anyone would like to like to join in with a kind of group to discuss that and come up with a kind of wording for a pledge that can be like a <laughs> universal global pledge, please you know please say so. Please uh, uh, come and have a conversation and let's get involved and let's really make that happen. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well done. And thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.